um, first time I've ever been described as glamorous, so thank you, Tom. Um, that's me on the screen with my first ever handheld console. It was the Atari Space Invaders. Um, the photo was taken 29 years ago, because I vividly remember it. Um, and the look on my face shows the joy that I had. And if you transfer that to the photo that Graham showed us yesterday of Handheld Girl, the only difference has been is that the device has changed. Um, now, I'm quite happy to admit that I am a gamer. Um, and what I'd like to see is a show of hands. If you think you are a gamer, could you raise your hand, please? Excellent. Kind of what I'd expect in an event like this. But also, I went into assembly, um, and that's our school hall on Thursday, and I said to the kids, put your hand up if you think you're a gamer. Now, interestingly, the adults at the front didn't join in. They don't see themselves as gamers. But the children see themselves as gamers. Some people in the audience see ourselves as gamers. And why? It was something that David before mentioned, that gaming has become more social recently. It's not about gaming by yourself. And it's using that social aspect of games within the classroom. Why do they play games? These are some of the reasons that the children came up with that they enjoyed playing games because they were exciting. They were funny, had fun, it was in control. Now, instead of that applying to um, gameplay, wouldn't it be great if that was our curriculum? That we had a curriculum that was challenging, that we had fun, that it was exciting, that the children used and learned new skills. Creativity is like that. It's inventing, experimenting, growing. But instead of the word creativity there, I'd quite like to have the word curriculum. And the kind of curriculum that we want for our children is about doing all of those things on a daily basis. It's about playful learning. It's about secret learning. Now, that's a phrase that one of the children in my class came up with last year, which <laughs> kind of doesn't work, because it couldn't have been that secret, because they know they're learning. So maybe not. But I like the phrase secret learning. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of slides on our journey over the last three years. And we started off with Dr. Kawashami. And the quote from the advert, the learning is in our hands. I think that is shown quite powerfully in the photo. And that's where we started. We've got 30 DS consoles, 350 children. Each class is timetable to use it every day. I ask for a minimum of three times a week. Um, and we mainly started using it for brain training. But there's more titles coming out. So now we are looking at, oh, Professor Layton. Great project, cross curricular. We didn't give them one each. We gave it to them in groups. So they had to talk to each other. Um, they posed questions. And then the bottom slide is they went off and created their own villages. Uh, year six project after SATs meant to last sort of two weeks. We kind of went on and on with it, and the children really enjoy it. And we're looking at the um, latest one with a different school in a couple of weeks as doing a collaborative project. There's also Word Coach for spelling. So I have groups of year six um, that do spelling um, during reading time. We use this tool as well as sort of reading books. Um, as well as traditional texts, we're using the flips. So that in my desk, on my desk, we've got flip books during reading time. The children come out and go, oh, you know, can I read on the DS today, miss? Great tool for encouraging some of my boys in my class to read, particularly. Mist, um, Tim spoke brilliantly as normal yesterday, and he came into our school a couple of years ago um, and spoke about Mist. And what's been brilliant about this is the year 14 within our school, not me, so maybe why it's been so successful, is they now use it every term. They revisit MIST and look at writing around it and talking and listening and collaboration, all those key skills. The we is also used. Um, and we looked at the photo that David showed earlier of that engaged person. Now, if you look at that child there, he's completely engaged. We used um, Wild Earth African Safari in the summer term. And we went on safari. And um, the hats were optional. Um, but it was amazing that he had to wear the hat when he went on safari. Um, and we used, you know, a combination of free tools. And the children were completely engaged, and you have to go around quite carefully. And at one point, they disturbed the environment, and we were attacked by an emu. Now, if I tell you my class all sat there watching it, and then they all screamed and started backing off from the interactive whiteboard, that's how immersed they were in their learning. Um, and they actually thought they were on safari. But it provided a great tool in the summer term to enable them to write. Um, now, I'm nowhere in that picture because I don't need to be. Because the children are controlling the action. They're deciding where to go. Um, it's a game called Another Code R that we use every year in year six now. It's the second year. We've just finished it just before Christmas. And we don't even finish sort of chapter one. And there's four chapters to the game. And it's a story with flashbacks. So we use it for our writing. And they're in control. They're the character. They decide where to go. And then the writing and the learning underpins all of that. Mario Kart, perhaps one of my favorite topics that we're just beginning again this week. 
Those are some of the skills that we do, and this is what some of the work looks like. So we look at advertising, we, we design our own movable vehicle. Um, the bottom slide is actually to go on top of the cake. They all become a Formula One team and they have to launch. So um, in DT they make their own cakes as well with a different topping. Um, and we end the term with go-karting around the playground. Because we do commentaries uh, on the Wii and we say how fast we've gone, we do our times and then we actually race around the playground, which is um, quite a good day's fun as a teacher. Uh, Derek's already spoken about um, the work they do in Scotland. And it is sort of a time to share. And, and Consular are great at sharing their work. It's a shame, in a way, in England that we've kind of got to do it for ourselves. We don't have a consularium, but it's about sharing. And there are a couple of tools that are being used really well for sharing, and that's Twitter, uh, which has just, for me, been amazing over the last few years of sharing with other teachers across the country and across the world of ideas of how to use this games-based learning in the classroom. The other one is TeachMeet. Uh, which was held here Monday night, Sunday night. Days have gone too fast. And brilliant, again, teachers talking. And there's another teach meet on Friday um, at BET, which, again, will be more teachers sharing ideas. And it's a great way of getting that message and what you're doing across to everybody else. We, um, the Redbridge Games Network, which I'm a member of, was set up about 18 months ago. And it's a collection of schools working together. We started off with six, went out to 11. And it's sharing, all about sharing and talking and explaining what we're doing in classrooms. It's contextual hub for learning, so we use all of those titles. But it also enables us to increase our shopping basket. Budgets are going down, you know, we've got cuts in education. I can't afford a school, and my head teacher certainly can't afford, to enable me to have all these products in the classroom. So what we do in the Games Network is we each put in a small amount of our budget which then enables us to buy the titles that we build up a library so we all share. It's the same with the Wii's, with the PS3's. It's a library that we can go into and out of, which enables us to put games-based learning practice into our schools. And a couple of slides to show you from the different schools work around Endless Ocean, Mario Kart, Crystal Skull. Um, I love the photo. Um, he's actually got his iPad. just can't see his iPad. Um, but that's year one children with the iPad, and the other photo is with Nintendogs. Just Dance, fantastic. <laughs> In fact, some of my PE lessons now, the children are outside doing rain dances because they'd rather be doing Just Dance in the classroom than they would outside. Maybe it says something about my PE lessons, I don't know. Um, Nintendogs, um, we're a separate junior and infant school. So they said, oh, will you go up and do Nintendogs projects with year one? Well, I teach year six, year one's like this big. Do I have to? Because um, they might be a bit scary. And it was just wonderful. And the teacher took control of it, did the planning, had a wonderful two weeks. Guide Dogs for the Blind came in. It was completely cross curricular. And on the last day of the project, I took my entire year six class up to the year one classes. And we split up and they shared. And you, you can see the pictures of them sharing their learning with each other. It is about sharing, and these networks are growing. And there's just two examples. Um, the East Midlands Games for Learning, Suffolk. I know Sue Whitehead's here from Sheffield CLC who are doing fantastic stuff with games. Enfield CLC. The list goes on, and I apologise if I've forgotten somebody in this room, that teachers who are using games-based learning in the classroom, it's no longer now, or it shouldn't be, you know, well, that's my work and that's what you did. It should be about our work and getting that message out there and sharing. So it's not that reinventing the wheel. It's, yes, this used, why don't you have a go? It may not work. Sometimes it doesn't. But that's where we learn best, make mistakes, and we move forward. Research has been quite interesting. Um, we haven't done any huge-scale research. What we did start in September was eight schools looking at the effect of games-based learning on disadvantaged learners, maths and English. Some small scale, from six pupils, to large classes. And the first one was maths, and it was year one class, and these were some of the outcomes on the board, as well as enthusiasm and engagement. Now, these cases stand alone, but what's happening this term is we've each taken a case study from another school and transplanting it to see if we can replicate it. I spoke about narrowing the gap, and Geary's Infant School, what they did is they chose six children who were quite often absent, quite often late, weren't engaging, and they gave them each a console, and they said, that's yours. Take it home, engage, play, bring it back into school. Now, before the project, 
two terms before the project started. Out of those six children, in total, they were late 128 times, uh, absent 128 days in two terms. They were late 26 times. The term that the project happened, when they had the DS that they could take home, they were never late and they were never off school because they wanted to come, they were engaged. Now, that to me says quite a lot and that, that project's been replicated to see, well, it worked in that school, will it work in others? And that research is sort of ongoing and hopefully we will be able to publish something as a group afterwards. But it's all about doing that research and sharing. Other impacts, you know, motivation, perseverance. They could move forward. It's that signpost. That's what gains based learning. The biggest thing for me is it motivates. Motivates me as a teacher. I get really excited. Um, quite annoyingly so, probably, for the kids in my class. But it's the creativity. It's, it's inspiring. It's, you know, stimulates their learning as well. This is where we are now. And it's like, which direction do we go? You know, I want to go forward and keep investigating skills. And I think as educators and as teachers and professionals, we need to ask ourselves that. Um, you know, it should be essential to keep an open mind. And better yet, eager to try new things. And that's what I tried to do. Um, that's game over for me. I'm Twitter at Dawn Hallibone. Please feel free to get in touch. Thank you. OK. Dawn, thank you so much. That was absolutely tremendous. And I think it's very exciting for me to sit there and you know, listen, look at that graph, you know, these, these amazing figures, and think this is not, you know, wild-eyed utopianism. This is practical stuff that is also incredibly inspirational. And um, I think we've got time for just one question, a really pithy question for Dawn. If we get, uh, wave your hands in the audience if you really have something you wish to ask. So, Hi, Dawn. It's Bob. Hello. How much of this are you pushing into secondary schools? Because it seems, again, there's this huge mm -hmm. transformation gap between all these lovely activities in junior school. What happens in secondary school? Um, one of the other schools in our um, research network is actually a secondary school. Um, and they used MIST last term, and they're looking at using Mario Kart this term um, to engage. And, and they're really starting to come on board, but it is getting that conversation out there. Because for the last three years now, we've sent children into secondary schools who are not only um, consuming those games, they're also creating them using things like Scratch and now Kodu. So yeah, it's making sure that conversation goes on, definitely. Dawn, thank you so much. Dawn Halliburton. Thank you.